Quick two. Proceeding on through the next unit. Taking on a creature that is from a previous level and a boss creature at that as we storm this fortress and we bounce some grenades off this wall. It's always nice watching the cycle action of a gun that you don't get to notice when you're playing. It's a strange thing, isn't it, to watch a game rather than to play it. It's kind of generated its own culture now and it's become part of the fabric. Nobody seems to see the alien nature of it or the, the absurdity anymore. And It must be said, before it was even this industry that we or I should say I belong to, as this berserker tries to get feisty with his jump. Before it became this, it was something that I already enjoyed to do, and I'm sure lots of you did as well. It's a fascination, isn't it, that we can look on it now that it's turned into what it is, but it always existed, it just didn't have the same names. I used to watch my sister play the, the NES and the SNES. I used to have a good time with it as well. I used to watch my dad play. Like, I don't know what it is, I think there's just... I think when you love something to the extent where you're willing to not take part in it and yet still enjoy it to a large degree, then you really are engaging with the medium on a level that means that you can't help but love it. And I think some people struggle to see the value in that and some people don't really understand it. But this, I don't know if this is a new enemy, I can't remember if we've seen her already, but this is the Iron Maiden. It's one of the most fair enemies in the game and I find it quite strange compared to some of the other ones who are a little bit more dangerous. Because she, she is very, very dangerous, don't get me wrong. She will kill you. But you stun her and then you kill her and it's all very within the boundaries of the ruling of the game. As opposed to this creature that's got the access to this new move that's terrible. And it's strange that they've given him that move because I just don't think it adds to the challenge of the game. I just think it makes it frustrating. And if you're watching this now and you've just played... I think they've done something to that move in the patch notes so you don't have to worry too much about it. They've fixed it, they've tweaked it, they've made it so that it's not the ultimate shit fest that it appears to be when you watch this. And to me, it just, it screams of people that don't know what they're doing in so many ways. But watch this fellow here. We also have one of the Icaruses knocking about. So be careful of this monster. They always tend to come in more than one. And if you have a look around, you might be able to hear him flying or getting stuck somewhere. But they, they've made the game better for a good reason, which is nice. And I feel like the developers realised that it just wasn't going to be conducive to a good experience, so that's why they didn't give it them. But you know, when people come back in thinking they've got better ideas, we end up with a nerfed railgun and that stupid jump attack. So jump attack has now been nerfed a little bit, and the railgun has been tweaked back into its original value of doing good damage, which makes perfect sense to me, because it's meant to be a... Like a kind of hit scan rocket launcher without the splash. It's meant to be a skill cannon. And that's exactly what you want in a game like this because this game is about aim. It's about movement. It's about understanding. It's about resource management. It's about all these things that made these kind of shooters really fun and really involved. And it's all the stuff that nowadays they stick it in walking simulators and call it survival horror. And it's just not my bag. So alas, you won't see much of that from me. But watching video games as opposed to playing them. It's interesting, isn't it? It's it's one of those strange phenomenons, I guess. Is there anything that you like to watch more than you like to do yourself? I suppose there's a joke in there, isn't there, about repressed sexuality? But we won't we won't take the low hanging fruit. But I think there's lots of people that, that have that. Like one of the things I really like to watch is Dead by Daylight. I don't even play that game. I've never played that game. Everything I know about that game is from watching a bunch of true talent videos that auto played on YouTube once and they were decent background noise and before I knew I watched several hours of it and I found it quite engaging. But it's interesting because I now know a lot of the terms, I now know a lot of the strategies, I've now seen you know lots of the killers, lots of the strategies as a survivor, lots of the strategies of what you do with the generators and the hooks and the escape hatch and whatnot. Like, I know a lot about a game I have never had my hands on, and yet, in spite of thinking it's pretty entertaining and recommending it to others, I have no interest in playing it. I just don't. It's one of those fascinations. You know, I, I can appreciate that that game is very skill-heavy, I can appreciate that that game's got a lot of replay value, and I can appreciate that it must be very good to be a skilled killer and to hunt down a full team of people who are all working together, you know? 
I imagine it feels damn good to escape from a very talented killer in that game when you know how to loop correctly and you use the right palettes and whatnot. That's the thing when it comes to video games, isn't there? There's, there's always something to chase, there's always a carrot on the end of a stick somewhere. And in spite of that, knowing full well that it is a quality product that's been supported for years and turned into this highly refined creation, I don't care. I have no interest. And it seems almost, doesn't it, like a, a strange dichotomy of sorts of to like something in a medium that you enjoy, yet to have no aspirations to to enjoy it on a different level. And it makes me wonder sometimes if if it's better that way. Because sometimes separation can help you see the, the greater picture. And then you can look at it and see that as much as it would be fun to play it, sometimes it's nice to just have that memory of it, that kind of untainted experience. Because one of the things you notice a lot, especially if you watch a lot of YouTube or Twitch, or if you're just a fan of watching people play games, is you'll see somebody play a game that you've not played for a long time, a game that's quite, you know, cherished in your memory, and it'll inspire you to go back. And you'll be like, oh my goodness, this looks great, I should totally go back. And then you go back and you, you have a less than stellar experience. <laughs> You do not have the nostalgia trip you were hoping you would have, and instead you end up getting annoyed and frustrated, and it does remind you that it is difficult to go back. It's Sometimes it's worth staying a memory rather than reopening it into a fresh wound. And that's not to say that you're always going to have that experience, and it's not to say that you shouldn't go back, but it definitely makes me reticent to want to jump on the, the slightest whim and whimsy of, of nostalgia, because those fancies can take you into a wonderful little hole, but they can also take you to a place that if you'd have never gone to, you would have had a much more cherished memory. And that's the frustration, isn't it? And it's something that I've I've battled with for a long time now, ever since like the Call of Duty days of missing old Call of Duty and new Call of Duty being really bad. And every so often you just you watch that old footage and you go, damn, I should boot this up and see if it's any good, see if I can get a couple of games and enjoy what I used to like and I mean, it's been over 10 years and it's infested and riddled with cheaters and the people who are on that game now are an interesting mix of people who never stopped playing and people who picked it up from a bargain bin because their, their mothers bought it them for Christmas and sadly, the naming on CODs these days is so confusing. It's like trying to explain to your grandma the difference between a Wii and a Wii U. But that's how it works, isn't it? You, you want to go back so much, you crave it. You crave the comfortability, the security of those old memories. And then you do unearth them, and you realise that something should stay buried. And I think that's why watching video games can be such a, a popular phenomenon. Because it gives you the nostalgia trip, it gives you the love, it gives you those good memories without crushing you with the gravity of realising that you don't remember all the shit, you don't remember the bad memories, you don't remember the times when, you know, you couldn't find a lobby and you were queuing for ages, you don't remember the times when... You know, you, your account got reset, or or you lagged out of a, a lobby when you were winning and doing really well, or some nonsense here or there, or that argument you got in with your friend where you didn't talk for, for two weeks and it comes back and you're like, damn, I still think I was right, you stubborn bastard. You get to avoid it, and you get to pick and choose what you want. The cake is yours, and you indeed can eat it. And I think that's so valuable. And I think that's why there are people now who spend more time watching video games than they do playing them. And the the interesting part, which is the bit that the IGN comment section wouldn't understand, because if you've ever seen any of the articles on that website talking about influencers, and uh, don't get me wrong, I don't like people who refer to themselves as influencers, and I don't like people who egregiously overuse the term content, because it's kind of... It's, it's just a surgical tool to steal the joy, the art, and the creativity from this medium, and you've seen, you've seen the people that do it. And I don't think it's intentional. I just think it's the nature of anything. Once you start referring to something in one of those overarching... ...monikers, it just takes away the individuality of it, and it homogenizes the value. And of course, you can still, that doesn't mean a person who uses the term content can't make something good and worthwhile. It's just that I do think it gives you an out, doesn't it? It's, it's the whole, the death becoming a statistics that you don't see the human behind it. You just see the number, you just see the fatality. 
And I think it's super dangerous, that. Because it's just masking the... Masking the true value, isn't it? But so many people watch more than they play now. And they enjoy it. And I think it's a, a wonderful thing that we now have access to that. Because in reality, when you think about it, it really is no different than watching a sport or, or watching something recreational or watching anything. Like, think about in the good old days, before, in the long, long ago, we used to go somewhere to watch someone perform something. And of course, you can still do that now. But now we have the ability to bring that to ourselves, bring that to our own doorstep and indeed enjoy it from the comfort of our armchairs. It's an interesting trap there. You got the, the flyer with the berserker on the doorway. I also didn't have armor for a little while just then. And you gotta be real careful when you got no armor in this game because it gets very challenging then. I feel like on Nightmare there shouldn't have been armor. You should have just had to have been really, 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 really good and respawn a ton. Because this is another one of those interesting situations, isn't it? Where you could say that this game's not difficult because you can save scum. But I would argue that even if you save scum this game, it can be difficult because you can save yourself into some really bad situations. And as much as being able to quick save and quick load is a blessing that you control, it can also be a poison if you do it in a bad situation. And it happens in all of the games that let you do it. I just recently did a Max Payne 2 project on YouTube. And about three times I thought I was clear, so I pressed quick save to bank the encounter. And there was a guy who could see me and just shot at me. And the moment he shot at me, he put damage on me or he killed me. And every time I respawned, I'd die before I even had a chance to do anything. And I had to really force some of those encounters. And it's a big old pain in the ass, but it's my fault for not knowing that that wasn't the end, you know? You can't blame the tool for something I did. And that's why I really like that system. I feel like it enables you to build the experience that you want, and when you get put in a bad corner, you put yourself there, so if you start complaining at that point, you're just a bitch. And I do think that that is a, the best way to look at it. Because if complaining doesn't work, and in my experience it rarely does, it's time to do the better option, which is to find a solution. You know? Be the change you want to see, and be the driving force behind said change. More Iron Maidens here. You'll notice that these creatures turn up in doubles a lot. They remind me quite a lot of the, is it the Vos in Quake 1? The creature that is at the end of the game that fires a tracking projectile. Those guys tended to turn up in groups just to make it a bit difficult to isolate and kill them. That was such an interesting enemy, that. Very gimmicky, but gimmicky in a way that makes them unique. They also looked like some kind of Eldritch Abomination, which helped too with the whole Lovecraftian aesthetic they were going for. But keep on keeping your armor up. Make sure you do as much looting as possible. Swap between all the weapons you, you can to give yourself the best advantage. And save as frequently or as infrequently as it helps you get through the game. Apparently on the achievement list on Quake 2 this time around, they don't mandate that you do anything on Nightmare. Which I think is a little bit of a joke, personally, but... I think I've said my piece when it comes to achievements. They've not really been achievements for a long time, and it's just filled with people doing the cowardly options and cheating them now, so it's without any value, even though you could argue it never had value. But I just think it's sad that they they put something like that in this game, and then no players will experience it because everybody's looking for the lowest common denominator so they can get to the next thing to consume. We're not really players anymore, are we? We're just consumers. And they like that because it means that you don't get too attached to new products, you don't feel the connection of ownership because everything is going to be digital and it's going to not be tangible for you to feel like it's part of a collection at all. But screaming into the next unit of Quake 2 on Nightmare, no BFG, no Super Soldier Serum. And we're moving into a room here with a, a bunch of bad fellas. We've got enforcers, we've got rails firing off, even though we managed to get rid of them quite quickly. And it's just, we're getting to the part of the game here now where a lot of these encounters are going to start getting much tougher as we progress towards the palace. And the palace is the hardest, and I think it's the worst part of the game. It's where the fun goes to die and the balance just takes a, a nice hot and sweaty weekend in some disgusting place and comes back with malaria and dies. But it's still fun. 
And that's what happens when you make a good foundation. If your foundation is strong, even if some of your aspects are still weak, the enjoyability factor is there because you enjoy engaging with what you've designed. Uh, even if what you've designed is a piece of code that was never meant to be engaged, being engaged, and it results in enemies flying through the sky in a berserker pattern trying to bounce you around with incredible hitboxes and absurd collision. But keep swapping your weapons, keep on top of it. Remember you have a shotgun and it is damn good. And it will put a, a thorn in the sides or the paw of all these people trying to one-up you. Keep going on, keep killing, keep quaking. On the previous video I was talking about the idea that we now watch video games more than we play them. I was also opining the idea that instead of being players we're now collectors. And instead of truly collecting we just consume because nobody owns anything anymore. We've all convinced ourselves that DRM and, and passes that give you access to licenses that aren't even yours are, are a good idea. And it was inevitable, I guess, because in the beginning when the idea of needing the internet to access a product you'd paid for seems insane, but slowly over time, just like how the rain erodes the mountains, we've now got to a place where people are almost completely clueless to the fact that they were once ever against that concept. And the sad thing is, the games that they're designing now are designed to be enjoyed for about an eight-month period and then disposed of in time for the new one to trundle along. Be careful here, though, there's going to be a bunch of in technicians in this zone. And the technicians aren't the most dangerous thing, but they're bulky enough to distract you so that their friends can injure you. And I'll put on the... is it the hyperblaster, this one? Every so often I'll put this gun on just for the diversity, because I'm not using the BFG, but it doesn't mean I'm not going to use the power cells, because I want to show you something that's hopefully more interesting than a man running around with a double barrel shotgun. And we've all seen DSP play Doom 2016, and it wasn't very enjoyable. But this sequence here, the water has a current in it, and it's going to fight your movement and fight your ability to maintain your target. So I'm going to do everything I can on this corner to get rid of a lot of the enemies with splash damage before we go down here, because this is a very difficult fight because of the environment. Like, you have to hold back, and even then you are being pushed, and everything has a kind of weird inertia, thanks to the water. And there's also some interesting collision going on here, stopping you from getting the, the best shot. So trust me when I say this does not feel good, and it is not fun to play, but it is what it is. Also, folks, you'll have to forgive me if a couple of deaths get through the edit, because it's quite difficult to see them on the timeline for this game, because the quick save and the quick load is so fast, there's no, like, like succession of the audio. It doesn't dip in a, in a way that is easy to, to navigate and see on a timeline. It's just so seamless and so swift. And in many ways, it's an interesting problem to have. Because it means that your game is loading really quickly, and you're back in the action so there's no downtime, which is amazing for recording. But as an editor, it is a bit more difficult to get the consistency and the speed and the efficiency that you're looking for. Because over time, you learn to see what is happening in a game just by looking at the audio form. And that might sound a little crazy, but it's like when you get good at anything, you know. You become Cypher in the Matrix. He doesn't see the code, he just sees blonde brunette. And it is the same here, but with this game, there's just the tiniest moment of quiet as you load in that you can see there. And if you zoom in and you make your wave length really big, you can see it a lot better. But at the size I usually use when I'm scrimming through to try and get it done as swiftly as I've, I've learned how to over a decade of doing it, it definitely is one of those things where it can be quite e easy to let one slip by. But again, a great problem to have, because it means that the industry's got to the point where we are back in the action. And you know what's terrifying? Is this game came out, like what, 20 plus years ago? And the industry now is not like that at all. You don't get back into the action. You know, they're preaching how these, how gaming now has SSD capability, and yet we have these death sequences that last forever and are the most frustrating thing in the world. Two games I've played recently did this too to the chagrin of, of what I enjoy. Lords of the Fallen had an animation of your character falling down, like clutching his chest and collapsing. And then only when he truly collapsed, 
they put a symbol on the screen to symbolize that you were dying. And then the symbol had to erode in a motion graphic way, so it looked quite pretty. And just as it eroded, it started loading. That whole process takes like 20 fucking seconds. It's 20 seconds of death before the game starts loading. And for me, it should be fucking loading the moment you die. I don't want to see a 20 second masturbatory piece of motion graphics. I want to get back in the game. And it's so frustrating. And then another one that I didn't expect, because A, I didn't think I'd die, and B, it's just not something that ever really occupies your mind, uh, was a Nintendo game by the name of Luigi's Mansion 3. In Luigi's Mansion 3, you, you, your life goes to zero, Luigi kinda does an animation, a cute animation, and he falls down. And then the screen zooms away, and then there's this weird spotlight that moves around, and it reveals, like, good night or something. And all of this lasts far too long, because you want to get back into the game where you died, and you shouldn't have died to begin with, because it was probably something fucking annoying. And, uh, and in that game, it just so happened to be quite annoying, because there's a sequence where you fight a boss in a rubber dinghy. And conceptually, the idea is pretty interesting. You're in this dinghy, you use your hoover to move around, and there's spikes on the, out the exterior of the zone. You wait for the boss to spin out, you grab him, and you fire him into the spikes, you get off, you suck him up, and then you win. But the problem with that game, I don't know if it's the emulator, I don't know if it's because of the dead zone on the controller that's being emulated, but there's times when your fucking vehicle does not drive correctly. <laughs> so you're trying to get away from this guy, and you're just not moving right. And the whole thing just feels like a half assed half-baked idea. And something that starts off as really charming and really funny, turns into something fundamentally annoying. And it's about, say, 70% through the game. That was the first time I died in the whole game. And it was because the game did not control the way it had controlled up to that point. So to see that elaborate death animation, it just made me crave, like, fucking emulator where you just respawn instantly by pressing one key. And it's an interesting thing, that, isn't it? Because do you take the time to make death cool? Do you take the time to do something unique and something artistic for death? Or, or do you just go straight to get the gamer back in the game, don't give them the opportunity to turn it off? Because I'm of two minds with this. On the one hand, if you do something really cool and someone dies, you might create something that has never been done before and, and a new trend in gaming will emerge and you'll go down in history for inventing it, which is really cool. On the other hand, while you're doing this, you'll be actively frustrating a person that doesn't care about the values of that. And for me, the answer to this, the solution, is easy. You can come up with a really cool death, like fancy death animation or fancy death sequence or something to some kind of fanfare designed around dying, but then you need to give the player the ability to skip it. And it needs to not be coming at the liberty of loading. Because if you're just masking loading, then we're back to the same issue we've been trying to avoid for a long time. And gaming has come up with several situations in which to try to circumvent the loading problem. And now with SSDs, it's got a lot better, but there are still these hold-alls from it that, that game design is using to make sure the game runs. And I noticed that on the Suicide Squad footage, if you saw that recently by Rocksteady. There was a sequence where four of the Suicide Squad characters went up to like a door, and each of them got in place holding a different part of the door. And all I could think of is like Gears of War going up to something and needing the partner to be in proximity to come and open it. And it's it's been what? Gears came out in 2006. It's been that many years, and, and we're sitting on this now. It's just like... How can we still be holden to this standard of, like, syncing the game to progress into the next zone and the next loading plane? Like, it it just doesn't make sense to me that we're using this antiquated system to achieve something that you would think would be a lot easier. Uh, this is a pretty mean trap as well. You get a bunch of berserkers behind you when you push through that corridor, so be real careful here. Usually circle strafing the right way can keep you out of their attacks, but if you play on a high FOV, there's times when they swing, they come nowhere near you and it still hits you because sadly the FOV can make things seem farer away than they are. And then just be very careful of the tank on this corner. This guy's a douchebag. There are some manipulations for the tank that work really, really well, and then sometimes you just get your ass beat because he's very dangerous. But respect him, see what you can do. And then... When the tank commander turns up later on, 
you'll wish you were fighting normal tanks because that enemy is just like... <laughs> we couldn't come up with a compelling way to make our game difficult, so instead we just made it bad. And the first playthrough when I bumped into those tanks, I was just like, what were they thinking? I always wonder that as well. I wonder how they get the HP values of some of the enemies in some of the games. Do you think it just... They throw a random one in and it just kind of worked and they never tweaked it? Or do you think they, it goes through several permutations? Because I like to think that they tweak it and tweak it and make it as fast and as, as satisfying as possible. But there are some games where you're just like, how did this enemy make it through the QC process? Like, where is the quality here? But I suppose it all depends on what they're trying to do. Because that's one of the weird things, isn't it? You know when a game is designed in a way that is like the antithesis of what you enjoy and what you value and what you think a game should be? So in your mind, it's just badly designed and it's been badly designed from the ground up. But to the person who made it and the people who enjoy it, all they see is, is like a different type of gameplay. And there's nothing wrong with that, objectively. It's just when you're so diametrically opposed to it, it makes you wonder how you can enjoy it. Like, where is the satisfaction here? And, and I've bumped into that in a lot of games, where it's like, I can appreciate the, the quality, I can appreciate people like it, I just need somebody to give me a compelling conversation as to why. Like, why is this fun, you know? And a lot of the times, it's, it's just one of those things, isn't it? It's like a, a flare of people's personality. People, people looking to do menial tasks and busy work in games so that they can turn their brain off from the menial tasks and busy work of their life. Like, that to me is one of those ones that I find really confusing. Because it's like, games are an escapist format, and, you know, we can all accept that that's the truth. But why would you escape your reality only to do a digital equivalency of what you are avoiding? That to me sounds like you're buttering your bread with more bread. And I just don't understand it. And, and I have some friends who've got some interesting ways they like to play and some like neurotic approaches to things. And when I've, I've discussed that with them to try and get an insight into why they do it the way they do it, it's always a compelling thing just to have tastes that, you know, vary so drastically. Because everybody is so very different. And, and that's why it's cool that there are all these games that are coming out that are so different. But at the moment, there seems to be this epidemic of cozy fucking farming games. And I'm sitting there thinking like, dude, there are more cozy farming games than there are indeed farmers active right now. What is going on? Farmers can't be playing these games, dude. They wouldn't be wasting their time, surely, on some digital bullshit. They're too busy doing actual farming. So it must be people that have got this romantic notion of what farming is, and they've always just kind of wanted to have a couple of acres of land and like wake up and work the field and be salt of the earth and, you know, have rough calloused hands and then come home, wear a nice thick jumper and get some like stew or something. I don't even know. It just seems fascinating, doesn't it? And I suppose it's, you know, it's all role play, isn't it? It's all some kind of fantasy in some way, but cozy farming simulators. It's just insane, isn't it? It really is a strange one, that one. I'm just craving shooters at the moment. Like, I want to get back on Street Fighter 6 because it's an amazing game. But for whatever reason, I do that thing, I don't know if you like me, where I'll try to cover something when I'm not in the mood. Like, when I was covering this game, I wasn't really in the mood to play a shooter. But by the time I'm finished and I've warmed my hand up and I'm enjoying shooting, I'm like, damn, I'd like to play a shooter now. And I seem to always be on the cusp of wanting something else. Do you ever feel like that? Where it's like, oh, there's this really, really cool action game, but I'm not really in an action game mood. And then you play it, or you do it, or whatever, and then by the end of it, you're like, damn, I'm super into action games now. And it's like, oh, I hope I can find another one. But there is none. So you're in a super action game mood, but the only thing you can do is play a first-person shooter, because they're the only games that just got released. So you start playing the first-person shooter, you're not really in the mood, and then by the end of it, you're like, damn, I'd like another shooter, and then an action game comes out. It, it just always seems to be on the back edge. Always blindsided by what you don't want. And I don't know if that's just my brain. Maybe it's just a form of neuroticism or ADHD or whatever else, but it does feel like that sometimes. Like, you can never quite get what you want. And I know that sounds pretty childish and, and like, self-centered. Which I suppose we can all be that way sometimes. Be very careful here though, guys. The moment you run out of armor on this game is when you start to having to play really well. 
Because if you don't, you're just going to get lit up and you die super quick. It was funny when I was streaming this on on Twitch, because I did an entire playthrough before I decided to make a walkthrough. And I was jumping a lot more on, on Twitch, because of course it's quick, you jump a lot, right? But I don't like the movement in this game as much as the first game. So I, I kind of avoided doing it and just focused on the aim. There were a lot of people that did not appreciate the repeated huh, 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 the sound effect when you jump. And I remembered that from that session, so I thought, I'm going to try not to jump too much, just in case there's someone who's quite sensitive to audio and doesn't want it to constantly be going the whole time. Because there's definitely a, a temptation in Quake to just bunny hop everywhere. Especially when you get used to it and you get warmed up. But I was fortunate in that when I, I left enough time between playing on stream to actually covering it where I'd played some other games so it wasn't directly in my mind to just jump around the whole time. But if you're wondering why I'm not bunny hopping more, it's purely based off the fact that uh, some people did find it quite grating. And I can completely get that. Like I've been watching someone play Modern Warfare 3 and they're using the Alucard skin. And he keeps talking about grenades every time you use a grenade, and it's the same cue every time, and he says it like three to four times in a row. It's really bad. It's like, tossing a grenade! And he just keeps saying it. It's the worst. And I never understand those games where they've got a one audio for one action, and it's on such a high frequency that it happens a lot. Like, that is a recipe for somebody to mute your voices in your game. It is a recipe for people to despise your audio design. And it's why you've got to be really careful. It's like those indie games where they only have one footstep sound. So the whole game sounds like you're just smacking a piece of metal with a hammer. And it's the exact same pitch, the exact same tone, the exact same decay, same attack. The whole thing is just like, what is going on? Ding, 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 ding. It's like, Jesus, dude. It's just perfect and awful. And the sad thing is, is your brain is used to variance. Because your brain is so used to variance, you expect to see it. And when you don't see it, you get confused. Speaking of confusing, the bloody grenade, man. There's a game. Is it called Hrot? I think it's the Hrot. I don't know how you say that. I think it's like a, a Slavic word. But it's kind of a quake love letter set in, in like Chernobyl. It's got the whole Russian stalker clothing that it is wearing that is masquerading as and in that game there's the ability to knock back the grenades that get bounced at you like that so if we had that ability we could just kick them kick them back to him and make him regret it but in this game you have to respect it and whenever you have to respect something it gets interesting but not as interesting as a knockback on this cannon absolutely fascinating how much that pushes you back i wonder what id are up to at the moment because they must be doing something. It's been a while since Doom Eternal DLC. Can you imagine if we get Quake Eternal? If they were going to do that, I'd rather them call it Eternal Quake. Just because it's a different play on words then. But I'd really like to see them do something with Quake. See what they could conjure. Because I think the big temptation is to just make Doom Eternal again. But one of the nice things about Doom 2016 to Eternal is they're comparable games with similar systems, but they are not the same. And I think that's their greatest strength. Because there's enough difference in them, you will have a favourite, you'll have one you prefer more than the other one, and then you can simply, you know, focus on the one you like the most. And by revising and changing and altering those features, they've made a really unique like set of skills for people to play with and they're similar enough that you can pick them up but then when you start getting to the higher level of it and understanding what the loop is it is quite different so to do that again would be really interesting because i would imagine there's a lot of people who wouldn't mind more doom eternal because it was such a fun game but what do you do it's such a tricky conversation and I wonder how long they'll be teasing it before we get anything or before it releases. Can you imagine if they just shadow drop a new game, id Software Shooter, just ends up coming out of nowhere and just being like, boom, son, pure gameplay, and it changes the industry. It's the equivalent of what Doom was all those many years ago. It just launches and everybody goes, oh my god, they're changing things here. 
They're breaking reality and sewing it back together in their own way. How did we never think of this before? But I suppose for every chance that that might happen, there's also a chance it could be like Daikatana, or like the original Prey on the... where you played as Tomasi, where these games were good, but they weren't as good as the hype would have made them seem. You know, something like Rage. Rage was meant to have all this technology, all this ambition, all these things, and admittedly it's a, a very interesting shooter doing some different things. Be wary of this sequence as well, guys. Claustrophobia in these kind of shooters is a death sentence. So as soon as you get off that elevator, push forward, get past him as you can, and keep moving so you just don't get mauled by grenades. That encounter didn't seem like too much, but I, I did get wrecked on it. And that's the thing about a game like this. When you watch this project, you're going to see all the, the mistakes trimmed out. You're going to see this one coherent piece of gameplay. That does not mean that that's what it was like. And admittedly, I didn't die too much on this one compared to the first one. The first one was way more difficult to record. But I still did die occasionally from overextending or sleeping at the wheel. And that's what happens. If you're not completely on it and paying attention, the game will remind you that it demands that you do. And that's what makes it so fun, and that's what makes it so interesting and so challenging. And that's why I miss this generation of games. Because unless you play the indie scene, you're not going to really get games like this. And even the indie games have got a lot of design in them that I'm not the biggest fan of. It's very difficult to, to hit on all the notes to capture my attention. It's one of the frustrating parts about, you know, having a higher standard and specific tastes and having a low tolerance for for just homogeny and repetition and the underwhelming state of modern video games. Because I, I took some time to play a game on my own recently and I don't usually do that because I can't, I don't have the time, I know that sounds crazy but when I'm not doing things for YouTube or recording or setting up for YouTube, I'm setting up for stream and when I'm not streaming I'm, I'm doing YouTube, you know, and I do try to take as much personal time as I can, but a lot of my personal time is not playing games because I do so much of it for everything else. And it's not like I'm at that point where I don't want to play games or I'm burned out and I come to avoid it because I do it so much. It's just one of those things where I'll kind of go, oh, I'd like to play this, that could be pretty fun to just kind of relax and have a go at it. But then my brain will do the whole, but you should be working on this, you should be editing this, you should be recording that, you should be doing these uploads, you should be fucking with YouTube because it's been a cunt. There's all these factors that kind of vie for your attention. And I do like being busy, so it's great because I'm always bloody busy, but there are those moments where it's like, it would be nice right now to just not feel like I have to be doing anything and just sit down and play this video game like I used to when I was younger. And recently I did that with a sequel to one of my all-time favourite games, which is Luigi's Mansion. And that game started so good. It started in, in like the cutest, most perfect way it could have started. And admittedly, it was a little bit slow. I think the pacing on that game is a, sh a real problem. But it wasn't slow enough to put me off. And the first four flaws of that game, I adored. Because it did the things that the first game did. It was... Not the same, not quite as good, not quite as focused as I would like, but still upholding the things that I think Luigi's Mansion does best. And the big thing for me is, I don't want Mario, you know, I don't want Luigi to be going to different themed worlds and solving puzzles and doing cute little things. I want Luigi's Mansion. And after that flaw, the game turns more into the standard Mario fair. And I can't sit here and tell you that it's not good, because it is. It's charming, it's clever, it's simple, it's, it's beautiful, and it's fun. But it's not what I look at, and it's not what I'm looking for when I play Luigi's Mansion. Luigi's Mansion to me is, is about the ghosts, and it's about the, the condensed, simple puzzles where you stumble on some kind of clever like circumvention and you feel like you solved something and then you're rewarded by being cascaded with treasure. And every room has like four or five of these instances of you doing something clever and something interesting and interacting with the world. Sometimes using physics, sometimes using, you know, mechanics and then being rewarded with this loot. And then there's secrets and there's all these different facets and there's fights. And the fights themselves aren't too crazy or too complex, but 
they're frequent enough that they're threatening and you can grow to get better at them and, and optimize them and it turns into a really satisfying gameplay loop of enter this new zone, take on this new threat of ghosts and then your reward is all the loot and all the engagements and all the interactions which is really cool. And back in the day when that game came out, some people didn't like it that much because they felt that it was just a bit boring and repetitive. Go into room, hoover ghosts, suck up some treasure, do the next thing in the next room. And they still thought it was cute and quaint and had good puzzles. But I think some people thought that maybe it was a bit too one dimensional and it didn't have, it didn't develop to a point where they thought it should have. And you can't say the same about Luigi's Mansion 3, if that's how you felt about the first game. Because Luigi's Mansion 3 is constantly evolving, constantly changing, constantly giving you new mechanics, constantly building in scale and concept. But for me, it goes too far. It goes too far away from those core pillars that made that first game, to some people, repetitive, but made it, to me, a masterpiece. And a game that I will replay for the rest of my life and and have a, a childish glee and a big fat grin on my face because I love that gameplay loop. I like hoovering the ghosts. I like ramsacking the rooms and knowing about all the secret caches. It's, there's just something really calming and, and homely about it for me. And that might seem really crazy to some people that don't know that I'm such a Luigi's Mansion fan. You might think that that's insane and you might not have liked the game and that's fair, but that third game keeps moving away from it, moving towards puzzles, moving towards high concept like chains of rooms. And then the boss fights are quite frequent, but they they go from being, you know, quite fun and quite simple to quite awkward and annoying and slow and multi-formed. And it's, I just don't think it's the strength of Luigi's Mansion. And I don't think that the bosses in the first game were any good at all. I think they're the weakest part of it. And it's a shame too, because I like a good boss fight. But there are a few things about that first game that I don't like, and I've played it into oblivion, you know. I've done the hidden mansion, I've gone for the perfect score, I've gone for making sure that you get all the portrait ghosts so you can get the big pearl on, on one single suction. I've done all those things, and I've done it multiple times because I adore the game, and just speaking of it right now, I want to play it again. Because that is one of those games that symbolises one of the most special moments in video games, because it was the first console that I bought with my own money. And I really wanted to have that great experience with this sequel. I'd waited a long time to play it. And I did have a good time, but the more I played it, the more it outstayed its welcome. And I realized I'm probably never going to get another true Luigi's Mansion ever again.